Um, today, our guest of honor is my friend and mentor and colleague, um, Jennifer Butler. Um, so I would like to introduce Jennifer first. Um, Jennifer is originally from Mississippi, but she attended the University of Alabama for her undergraduate education, where she majored in international studies with a concentration in po political science and Asia and a minor in Japanese. Um, during her degree, she spent one year studying abroad at Kansai Gaidai in Osaka, and she went to receive her master's from the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom in Japanese studies with a research focus on international poli education policy in Japan. Um, Jennifer has worked in various educational institutes and government organizations in the US and Japan, including the Consulate General of Japan in Nashville, the Laurasian Institute, a Japanese international school in Atlanta, um, the University of Alabama, and the historically black university, Jackson State University in Mississippi. Um, she was also a JET program uh, participant in Hamamatsu Shizuoka. Um, so now Jennifer is the manager of the student relations team at the Tokyo headquarters of the Ashinaga Foundation. Um, that's where we work together. Um, and this is one of the largest nonprofits in Japan. Um, just a brief overview of what Ashinaga does. Um, we provide educational support Support, um, to domestic and international students who have lost one or both parents. Um, we have our uh, flagship program, which is called the Ash Ashinaga Africa Initiative. Um, and we work with students, university students, undergrads from um, 48 different Sub-Saharan African countries um, who are studying in Japan under the initiative. Um, so I, uh, more about that later. It's a very long, long story. Um, what Ashinaga does, we do so much. So um, Jennifer will dive into that towards the end of the conversation. But um, Jennifer studied at the IUC the year before me from 2017 to 2018. During her time at the IUC, she focused more on professional skills um, than so much going for graduate studies. So that is also going to be a key part of our discussion. But Thank you so much for joining us today, Jennifer. Welcome. I hope I did you proud with my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> um, okay, so first, let's just jump right into it. Um, we've spoken many times about your extensive relationship with Japan, um, your home state of Mississippi and the South in general, um, and of course, international education, which you're very passionate about. Um, your career has spanned through many facets of international education, but you always link back to Japan. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you started studying Japanese and the kikake, your, how you first got involved with Japan? Yeah, thank you, Lily. Um, so before we start, just let me send some really special thank yous to Lily and Richard and Leclerc son. It's been really nice working with you to join the alumni talks. I've enjoyed being able to participate in some previous ones and um, that it's really nice to see everybody here as well. I have some former IUC classmates that I see. Thank you guys. Hey guys. Um, and some friends and of course some family. So I'm really looking forward to just having a good conversation. And even if you know part of the story, I'm pretty sure that some of you on this call know a lot of the story. It's gonna be nice to just kind of see every, everything linked together and um, talk a little bit about how important IUC is to me. Um, but let's go backwards a long way because um, my starting studying Japanese, um, I couldn't start studying Japanese until college, but I've always loved Japan since childhood. Um, my mom's a librarian, so we were always at the library and I loved reading books about different countries and cultures and something about Japan just caught my attention and it was fascinating to me. So um, even though we were in Mississippi and didn't have a lot of access to Japan and Japanese culture at the time, I had books and I had the library. And so um, that was how I first was able to dive a bit into Japan. And so when I started looking for a college, I knew I wanted to study Japanese, um, but I also needed to go someplace that felt comfortable and was not too far from home at the time, um, but had a great Japanese program. And at the time when I was studying, there were no Japanese programs in Mississippi, um, but there is an excellent Japanese program at the University of Alabama. 
And some people don't realize how good the Japanese program at the University of Alabama is, but um, it's, it's quite good. <laughs> and so I uh, joined uh, the, the uh, international studies major in which you minored in a language in the area of concentration that you um, focused on and so started Japanese studies there. Um, part of the design of the major was that you had to do a study abroad in the area, the country that you were um, focused on. So that's, we had a great partnership with Kansai Gainai. So I had a, a year in Osaka. It's my first time leaving America and um, I went for a year. <laughs> and then um, after I came back to Japan, uh, sorry, to Alabama, um, I uh, was looking for what I was gonna do after graduation and of course, JET called me, called to me. And so I applied for JET and um, went back to Japan um, following uh, graduation. I know that path well. Um, that's exactly <laughs> what I did as well. <laughs> um, so after you graduated, you were on JET for three years in Shizuoka, which I think was the max at that time. Um, right. They've since changed it to five years, I believe. Um, but when you were in JET on Chizuoka, you weren't just an ALT. Um, you did some work at the Board of Education as well. Um, mm -hmm. And can you tell me a little bit about how that changed your perspective on education, seeing the administrative side of things as well as working in the classroom? Yeah, and that's exactly what happened. So um, of course, going on JET, you can go one of two ways, um, coordinator of international relations or assistant language teacher. And I went as an assistant language teacher and taught um, in junior high schools and some elementary schools in Hamamatsu. And I loved the students. I loved being in, you know, being able to share information with them. But I also realized that teaching was not my calling. <laughs> and so, um, but I was trying to think, you know, gosh, how do you still, work with students and young people, but not be a teacher. And so the last year of the, uh, my time on JET, there was a new position created in the Board of Education, which was to support our supervisor at the Board of Ed, administering the other um, assistant language teachers in Hamamatsu. And so I started realizing you could do administrative type work in education and that that could still connect you with um, this world of education and working with students, even if you weren't in the classroom. And one of the other things I realized was that I um, had to have Japanese for this position, like the position at the Board of Education when I'm working with our supervisor needed uh, Japanese skills. And luckily I had those and was able to do that when they requested it of me. I had a quite a similar realization when I was on chat. Um, <laughs> as much as you love kids, sometimes you just don't want to teach them <laughs> um, or do the lesson planning and put in all that work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna kind of fast forward because you have such an extensive and fascinating career. Um, I'll gloss over this a bit, but I will introduce. Um, so after JET, you worked at this Japanese immersion school in Atlanta. Um, and then you earned your master's degree in Japanese studies at the University of Sheffield. And then you went to the Consulate General of Japan in Nashville. Um, then you worked in admissions and recruiting at the University of Alabama in the study abroad office. Um, and then the HBCU Jackson State in your home state of Mississippi. So each of these experiences clearly gave you something that was very valuable. Um, a new perspective on international education, extensive experience working with Japanese community in the South. Um, and a deep insight into the workings of these kind of exchange programs. Um, was there one experience dur uh, during these jobs that was kind of the deciding factor that pushed you towards the IUC? Or can you talk a little bit about how the IUC got on your radar? Sure, yeah. So IUC, so the journey to IUC I think was gradual and, um, but was always kind of on the radar. I think anybody who studies Japanese at a deep enough level knows about IUC and the quality of the kind of um, uh, education you can re uh, achieve there. But um, so all of those experiences that you kind of traced out, um, I can, let me kind of walk through a little bit of them. So at UA, my minor, was Japanese. And I first used Japanese in a working capacity during my time in uh, on JET at the Hamamatsu Board of Education. 
Um, and then I actually use Japanese in almost all of my jobs, except the recruiting job at the University of Alabama in, um, in some capacity, right? Um, so my Japanese skills have always been an asset um, in doing these jobs. But I realized that I, you know, the jobs that I were, was able to do with the Japanese I had at the time, I could get by with my Japanese, right? I was able to use it, but I was always kind of protected from having to use it, right? And so I was getting by with the Japanese I had at the time, um, but then I realized like two things happened, right? So my first realization, it was after I did the job at the University of Alabama when I was doing recruiting, um, and uh, admissions work. Um, so I was able to talk with students, you know, travel around the South to try to recruit people to the program, the good programs that we had at Alabama, but it was completely disconnected from Japan and Japanese. And so I kind of a light bulb went off that I am going to stop fighting, not trying to um, have Japan and Japanese be part of my career because it's hard, right? <laughs> this is such a specialized kind of uh, skill set. And so I was like, no, I'm just going to go ahead and commit full, fully to it. I'm going to have Japanese and Japan be part of my career. And when um, I had a, another really specific in, in instance where I decided that that means I needed to make sure my Japanese was good. And it was when I had stopped working at the consulate and I had moved back home to Mississippi. Um, and I did some work at Laurasian Institution, which is when I was working on Tomodachi program, which is when I met you, Lily. But um, the program um, that was not the university program, I also did a separate program for the high school students that were coming from Japan to uh, the United States for these 10 uh, day short-term exchange programs. And we had an emergency with one of the students. Um, one of the young girls in the high school had um, to go to the emergency room at like two o'clock in the morning in the middle of, of nowhere. <laughs> and, um, and I couldn't help her as much as I should have been able to. Like we had to have Japanese in order to do the, the position on the uh, working with the students. And you know they tested our Japanese, but in, the, in this emergency situation, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I can't sufficiently help this child, right? And that's when I realized that's not gonna happen again. If I'm gonna have Japanese, I wanna make sure that this Japanese that I have, I can actually use in this capacity. Um, and so that's when I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go to IUC. <laughs> I'm gonna make this happen and start to uh, use Japanese comfortably in my career. And so that those all, it all kind of led up to that point. What a, what a terrifying time that must have been to be in an emergency situation and not know the right word or something. Because when you're grasping for that one word and you just, it doesn't click, that's also right. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of us can relate with, you know, just getting by on Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure when many of us start learning Japanese, you have a lot more confidence than once you get it to an advanced level and then you kind of grasp how much you actually don't understand. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, but so I, I wanna talk about the center a little bit more. So when I was at the center, we met pretty frequently. Um, mm -hmm. And during that time, I feel like you really pushed me to think strategically about how to use those 10 months. Because mm -hmm. when you were at the center, you really knew what you wanted to focus on. Um, you wanted to gain professional skills first and foremost. Um, and a lot of the students at the center want to gain more um, skills for research, which of course is also important. Um, but this professional skills is a little bit different than what the center was classically designed for. Um, so you also wanted to gain skills to explain um, social issues and identity issues that aren't talked about as much in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, I think the center has really seen an influx of these students who want to talk about professional and social issues um, more so than just talk about their research. Um, mm -hmm. So could you tell me a little bit about um, the strategy that you used for yourself to approach assignments and um, presentations at the center and whatnot? Right. Yeah. So um, I came to the center from a, a little bit different perspective. I wasn't needing to go for PhD level academic research. Um, I, want, I approached it from a career perspective. So I, I wanted a specific return on my investment, right? I had 10 months. It's really short in the 
grand scope of things. And so I knew that in those 10 months, I needed to maximize my time in classes, during my lessons, with presentations, and even with networking, because I was going to physically be in Japan. So I needed to maximize those uh, opportunities. And so um, for those of you who are not familiar so much with IUC and the structure of it, it's divided into four quarters and each quarter we have quarterly presentations, but even within our classes, we can focus on um, small presentations or research or writing, um, depending on what your, your background or interest might be. And so whenever we had a presentation or something that was free that we could choose, I wanted to tie it to my own career my own uh, experiences, my own background and things that I cared about. So for example, some of my quarterly presentations um, were for, um, I wanted to talk about the state of study abroad in the United States and the experience of exchange students. And so I learned how to present about that in Japanese you know, at IUC. Um, I wanted to introduce the idea of HBCUs. If you don't know what those are, it's historically black colleges and universities. It a, has a really strong, important position. Um, I think you may have been introduced to the concept of the HBCU because our current vice president graduated from Howard University, which is an HBCU in Washington, DC. So I thought that that would be interesting or important to, to learn to how to speak about. Also, um, during the year we were there, we had, there was um, a really, at, at IUC um, in Japan, there was a controversy about a really famous uh, comedian that did a blackface skit on TV. And so I decided I wanted to talk about that in one of my quarterly presentations as well. And I learned how to express um, about these kind of social issues as well. And all of that was intentional, right? And so my final presentation, um, I really wanted to focus on something that had basically, you know, shaped my career <laughs> thus far, which is the connection between Japan and the South and why it's an important topic and shouldn't be ignored. And it allowed me to do research and interview some important contacts within the Japanese Southern United States region. There are two um, state offices for Southern states in Tokyo. So there's the state office of Mississippi and the state office of Tennessee. They have actual representatives here in Japan. So I went and interviewed them and invited them to the final presentation and I'm still in contact with them now. And so I was really intentional about um, using the time at IUC for these kind of career and personal reasons. I think that's so fascinating. And I know you interviewed them and weren't their offices across from the center in yeah. the <laughs> One of right. those they're, they're in Yokohama in um and the World Porter building <laughs> near such a, such a coincidence. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, obviously when well not obviously but when we think of Japanese American connections and communities, I think a lot of people kind of jump to um, either of the coasts. Um, I'm from the West Coast, so um, I know there's a, a big Japanese American community in on the West Coast um, and you know, Jesse's over there in Boston, and that's also a, a big hub, um, Boston, New York area. But the South is something we don't really think of, but is very much, um, there's a lively community, and it's, it's kind of a newer community, from my understanding, because it has a lot more to do with business. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that when you went to the University of Alabama, you went there because there was, that was the only Japanese program in the South? I Not the only, but um, the best. Really good I got a scholarship, so. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so how has stuff like that changed? How has um, work, because you worked at educational institutes in the South throughout mm -hmm. your career, um, mm -hmm. and you know you're an expert on this, um, how do you think the American South relationship has differed and changed? Um, with Japan from other regions yeah the US. yeah no I I think so it's something that I'm, I'm really close to and really passionate about I usually you know I'm proud to say I'm from Mississippi I think that it helps to find it helps to understand like who I am um, but also Japan is also a part of me and so being able to connect these two things is really important and for anybody, any of my classmates that came to the final presentation um, I enjoyed being able to draw those connections together for, for um, the, uh, the final hapiokai, the final presentation. And so I, my 
point during the presentation and just in general is that um, it's important to understand kind of how Japan connects to different regions of the United States. Um, for the South, it's different from the East and West Coast. And for us down in the South, usually it's a much more economic based relationship originally, primarily, you know. And so, you know, there is a for example, a lot of foreign direct investment by Japan in Southern states. When I worked at the Consulate General in uh, Nashville in Tennessee, um, people would be surprised that there's like over 180 Japanese companies that are located just within the state of Tennessee, right? Mississippi has, is one of the few states in the country that has um, both a Nissan and Toyota manufacturing facility. And so these kinds of investments from Japan are very economically driven. And that seems to usually be how that they primarily function in the South. However, one of the things that I came across when I was interviewing the state representatives from Mississippi and Tennessee here in Yokohama was that they're like, it's not separate, right? Economic growth is great, but then that also helps to drive uh, increase in interest in Japan in the region. And that also will translate into maybe more um, students studying Japanese at universities, which also drives the strength of Japanese programs in the South, right? And so all of this is, is connected because then if you have like this serious study of Japanese in the South based off of an interest, economic interest, then you also have more cultural development. One of the biggest events that the Consulate uh, General of Japan hosted in Nashville is the Nashville Cherry Blossom Festival. This festival is huge and it has like, it's one of the cultural um, activities that have also will then drive um, the language acquisition and the economic uh, uh, environment because um, with the better cultural environment, the Japanese companies also feel more comfortable sending their staff and their personnel to the region. And then Japanese expats who move to the region also feel more comfortable. And then that helps drive interest. And it's all, it's like this great, cycle, right? Um, that also helps to drive sister city relationships. Nashville was able to establish a sister city with Kamakura just within the past 10 years, right? And it's, yeah, watch out, Ben. <laughs> That's all part of the, you know, this process. It's all connected. And so it's important for me, for people to not ignore that part of the relationship, the U.S.-Japan relationship. And it's good for my region because, look, I was a little girl who had no access to Japan for such a long time. And that, that's not the case for some other young people in the South and Mississippi and other places. Um, and it's good for the overall US-Japan relationship because I also strongly feel that if you don't understand American culture from the South and the Midwest in these non-huge you know, West and East Coast areas, then you're not gonna be able to have a good strong US-Japan relationship. So that was my primary focus for my final presentation. I feel like I, I just wish we could listen to your presentation. I feel like it must have been really interesting to talk about that South, the South relationship um, to Japan and interview those heads of state. Um, I'm sure that was a fascinating conversation as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for talking about that. Um, I want to segue a little bit more into what you do now. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we do at Ashinaga is obviously really fascinating, but um, can you tell me a little bit about the Ashinaga Africa Initiative and let our audience know what Ashinaga does and what the Ashinaga Africa Initiative is? Yes, happy to, because it's also something that is a, a wonderful thing that I wish more people knew about. Um, so Ashinaga is a Japanese uh, nonprofit organization. You already mentioned at the beginning that it's one of the largest in Japan. It has a long history. Um, it's pretty well known in Japan um, as being um, a social uh, change um, organization to help access, to help children who have lost a parent, one or both parents, or who have a parent that's been uh, disabled and can't um, work, to access education. And that access to education can be can you know you can do that in different ways, um, whether it's providing scholarships or providing. A community so that these um, young people don't feel isolated and alone because they're um, they you know they suffered the loss of a parent they know that they can talk to other people um, so all of that is part of the Ashinaga Foundation's uh, movement and mission and and goal and that having access to education will help change 
society for the better and for the world for the better. Um, and so it's it's a pretty well known organization in Japan, but we also have international activities that some people don't know about, and they've been going on for a while. Um, uh, but have most recently focused from 2014 on the Ashinaga Africa Initiative, which is the initiative that's um, will, as you already introduced, bring young people from sub-Saharan African countries to study in Japan, but in also in other countries around the world. Um, we have office in France, the UK, the US, um, Brazil, um, and so they, it's it's global. But I work primarily with the Japanese students, the students in Japan. Um, and I joined Ashinaga right after IUC um, from August 2018. It's been about two and a half years. Um, and I manage the student relations team. And we support more than 60 students in universities, studying at universities throughout Japan um, for the duration of their bachelor's degrees. Um, so as the manager of the student relations team for the Ashinag Africa Initiative, um, just to recap, you work directly in English to assist scholars who study in Japan with the scholars you work in English because they're, um, they speak English or they come from Anglophone countries. Right. Um, but they're, um, I understand you have to prepare students before they go abroad, um, either to Japan or other countries. Mm -hmm. um, we do that preparation in um, Uganda or in Senegal. Um, depending on the, the languages that those scholars speak, um, just to recap a little bit. Um, and so you also have to communicate with the universities in Japan, in Japanese, to help them adjust to university life and, you know, get used to being foreign and um, most times Black in Japan as well. Mm -hmm. um, so how did the IUC prepare you for that? And how does this different from your, differ from your previous positions in the states working um, in study abroad offices and um, study abroad programs. Right, so um, if, so I see, so first of all, I think going back to just some practical things, um, I would not have known about Ashinaga if I had not gone to IUC. Um, I, it was through networking, you know, being physically here in Japan that I, I happened to meet somebody who worked at Ashinaga and introduced me to the organization. Um, so physically being here was very important. Also, um, IUC prepared me in, of course, my Japanese skills. Um, Ashinaga is a Japanese organization. We use Japanese regularly with our colleagues. We sometimes have document internal documents that are only in Japanese. Um, some of my colleague team members maybe don't speak uh, Japanese, and so I'll do some interpreting or translating for them if needed to make sure that they're able to have the information um, from the organization that, that we need to do our job. So um, that has, that just in a really real sense, I'm able to do that because I've had um, my uh, Japanese skills in, uh, developed at IUC. And so then if we're thinking about externally, um, because we're, I'm working with students in Japan who go to Japanese universities, sometimes we have to communicate with the, organ the universities. Um, if we have, questions we need to have answered we, it, and they don't have English speaking staff then it needs to be in Japanese. Um, the students also are required to take Japanese language lessons while they're studying. So that means we have to communicate with the Japanese teachers. Um, we need to arrange their travel to and from Japan and, and the, you know, the, one of the 40 something different countries in, in Africa. So we need to communicate with the travel agencies. Um, we, it also overlaps into different government agencies. We have to understand what's going on with MOFA, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, with all these travel restrictions from COVID. And the, sometimes the information is better in Japanese than it is in English. So, you know, sometimes we need to write emails that are, you know, it's just all of this, the things that connect with using Japanese IUC help to prepare me for that. Um, it's similar in the fact that like my job with um, my position at home and here now with Ashinaga is that I get to work with students, which has always been a really important thing for me. And I get to work with education. Um, and I get to introduce Japanese culture to non-Japanese people, which has also been something that I've always enjoyed doing. Um, and I get to work with Black students, which, you know, that is really important in the grand scope of things. I think especially looking back over 2020, and the, you know, the year of the social justice, um, 
those students uh, have specific needs and some of those needs overlap. And so I'm able to help with that as well while they're doing their studies. Um, I get to work with students who maybe have high potential but limited opportunities. And I see that a lot in the South or at HBCUs. So that also overlapped. And then of course, working with bureaucracy, <laughs> working with the Japanese bureaucracy and understanding how to get things done even within all of that. Um, that effort that also has overlapped and so um it's different in the sense that you know of course i've already talked about how important working in the south is and the u.s japan relationship but now i get to um understand a whole nother aspect of japanese international relations which is with africa and working with african countries and discovering this part of international development which is just waiting to be explored and expanded even more and so under having being part of that for japan also is quite exciting and now i you know i feel comfortable using japanese so that because of iuc and and all of these um have come together yeah thank you so much for that um i we have gone we are at our time limit for the interview portion, but um, before we part, um, do you have any final thoughts, words of advice, um, something you'd like to leave with the audience? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's important to try to put things in a bigger picture, a bigger framework. You know, I can share my own personal story and why I love what I do and why I think it's important, but I think, you know, in the end of the day, you're like, well, why does this even matter? <laughs> you know, why is it important? And I think for one, for me, um, first and foremost, education, accessing education can definitely change somebody's life and can change their, you know, almost every aspect of, of their career um, and, and future opportunities. And that also will then affect the communities and their family members and, and everybody that they touch. So that's important. I also feel strongly about international education. I, I, I feel you gain a lot from having a chance to study outside of your own space. And that you that is really important. Um, and then having the chance to work with young people, because that is going to change the next you know society that we're all part of. Um, and then you know having be, being able to do all of that with Japan and with Japanese, um, finding a path to accomplish all of those different goals is a really rare and special um, gift. And I think that it's important to kind of, uh, for everybody to understand that your path might not be one way, but you can still accomplish a lot of the things that are important to you. And um, if using Japanese is one of them, then there's that opportunity as well. So that's kind of it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lily. Yeah, thank you so much. It was so interesting. Thank you, Jennifer. All of the claps. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jesse, I think, do you want to introduce the Q&A portion? Or um, if anybody has questions, um, you can type them in the box. You can DM them to Jesse LeClaire. She can read them out for you. Um, but does anybody have any questions? You can also just raise your hand and we can call on you. Uh, we have, yeah, oh, we have one in here that's a little bit more like forward looking. Um, so thinking about like what you've done up until now, this person said like you seem to have a real knack for finding rewarding jobs and always like finding that connection um, with Japan. And at the same time, like you know, you've you've said that Japan is an asset, but it's also a kind of increasingly specialized skill, right? I think you also acknowledge that in some ways, um, pursuing that interest in Japan can also be limiting in some ways as well. So sort of thinking about where you've come and all your success in your career so far, but then looking into the future, sort of like what are your thoughts on the future direction of your career, um, especially related to like continuing um, to live in Japan and pursue that interest in Japan? Yeah. So that's, uh, I feel like, it's easy to look back now and see the connections and see how it all fit together. It didn't feel like that <laughs> when it was actually happening. Um, it was, it's, a, it's a risk, right? I, I you know, chose this path that was going to be less straightforward than other kinds of paths. And one of those is including, is, is using Japanese. And I think the question 
needs to kind of go back to, well, why is it important? You know, who, why does this, this even matter? And I think for Japan, for me specifically for Japan, I think I've, it's clear, it's part of who I am. I don't, I can't separate myself from it. And it's something that I'm passionate about. And so um, having that be part of the, um, the greater picture, like the, the connecting thread is in some ways very clear <laughs> and in other ways very also um, frustrating <laughs> because how do you do that with all these other things? Um, looking forward, I think people who are interested in studying Japanese or in Japanese culture in, in general, you have to understand why does it important, why is it important to you? Um, and how can you use it as a skill that will help you build on something else? Because just having Japanese language in and of itself, is ju it's just a part of it, right? Um, having Japanese plus something is I think even more important, but there are some really important um, qualities and connections that our country or wherever you are have with Japan. And I think that it's, it doesn't make sense to ignore that even though it's, it's quite specialized. Um, going forward, I, I fully expect that I will still be doing something connected to Japanese and education and working with young people. Um, I love what I'm doing at Ashinaga right now. So maybe that will also expand into understanding more about the Africa um, sphere um, and how that will um, continue to shape a little bit of um, the world in, uh, as a whole. So yeah, it's kind of hard to say specifically because it wasn't plan from the beginning, right? It just kind of developed this way. Yeah, I really, <clears throat> I really empathize with that. I think like I only realized halfway through what I was doing, like, oh, Japan is what's relating all these disparate experiences, <laughs> <laughs> which I had realized earlier, but um, kind of related to sort of your very diverse experiences as someone was asking that you've been a bridge builder in like many different facets, not only between the U.S. and Japan, but also between diverse stakeholders, like connecting mm -hmm. universities, governments, nonprofits, student populations. Mm -hmm. So they were wondering if you could share any tips for handling this other aspect, this other dimension of intercultural in the sense of like connecting those different kinds of sectors and groups. Yeah. Um, I think for I think it, it, it's a mistake to think that they're all separate. They're all connected. And that goes back to, for example, if I'm working at a university, um, I need to understand about education. Okay, well, education, a lot of it is driven by policy. So that means I, under, I need to understand about how um, government works and how they deal with um, setting policy for um, a particular location or a particular country or a particular um, population of students, right? And so then that also will overlap into, well, students are not, or, you know, people are not just individual um, entities, their interests and also their skills will overlap into different areas. So having um, the understanding of, okay, well, if the needs of this student population are that they've lost a parent, they need some kind of special emotional care or support, then that might go into these specialized nonprofit groups as well. So I, I don't think that they're ever separate. Everything kind of intersects and is and, and interconnects. And that understanding that and having a bigger picture, I think helps you do whatever your specialized job in whatever field you're in better, right? Working at the consulate, it was public diplomacy, um, but it also was communication. It also was uh, international exchange. It also was government. It also was um, you know, language, it was economics. Like I said, in the South, a lot of our cultural programming is economics driven. So I think that building the bridges is kind of, I thought he might, is kind of, it make, you have to do it. <laughs> like you can't not have all these uh, stakeholders involved if you're gonna, I think, do your job well. Awesome. That's so inspiring. Instead of seeing the differences, like seeing the connections and seeing the similarities. Um, someone was wondering about, it looks like they're also a Jennifer Butler fan, as am I. Um, and they're wondering 
now that you've achieved so much and you are such an inspiration, what do you see as your next challenge, the next thing out there that you want to you wanna tackle? Mm, I will let you know when I figure that out. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not quite sure, I think as everybody uh, can feel, we're not sure what the world is gonna be like in even six months from now, let alone next year. So any plans that I had, uh, you know, two years ago, it's completely different <laughs> now. So um, whatever it is, I'll, I'll keep you posted, <laughs> whatever that challenge is. Okay, we will we'll be excitedly waiting for your updates, Jennifer. Okay. Um, there are some IUC related questions here, if we could maybe transition to those, some of those. Um, Giles is wondering about what you think might be needed to help draw more students from HBCUs uh, to prepare for and to study at the IUC. Yeah, so I think uh, for, let me talk about my experience working at Jackson State, which is you know, one of the most well-known HBCUs in uh, Mississippi and in, in the South. Um, I worked in the study abroad office, which was being reestablished after a period of dormancy. And the, um, the important thing that was the key at the time that I was working at, the, uh, at Jackson State was that the top administration, the president of the university felt that international education was important. And because that support came from the top, they, we were able to invest in a lot of development for the program. But it also was important to have, um, I think, and opportunities created for students to take advantage of. Um, there were so many students at Jackson State who wanted to study abroad, but their needs were very, very specific. And most of it was just accessing information and finding out how you could do it. You know, statistically speaking, uh, people who study abroad are usually um, not going to be a minority group, right? Um, Black students and students of color statistically just do not study abroad as much as other students do. And it's not so much that they're not interested, it's just that they don't have the same access of information. Um, and so some of the things that we did at Jackson State where there was, um, at the time, the State Department had a very strong um, push to diversify study abroad. And I was able to write a grant and receive funding to invest in our study abroad capacity building, specifically targeting underserved populations for studying abroad because there are so many benefits to studying abroad, right? Um, economically, students have better job aspect prospects when they've studied abroad. They have higher rates of graduation when you study abroad. And there's, um, there's other uh, real statistical benefits. And so reaching out to HBCUs, because there's so many competing priorities for students, the student population at an HBCU, I think these really practical benefits of studying abroad should be emphasized, right? And if it's in Japan, for example, Mississippi has the Nissan and Toyota facility and say you have an HBCU grad who's done a study abroad in Japan and then they go and apply for a job at Nissan up the highway and they see on their, uh, on their resume that they've had actual experience in Japan, then that also makes them more employable, I feel, or it makes them have something at least to talk about at the interview, which would then maybe have, have better economic prospects for the students. So, so I think for HBCUs in general, yes, international education is good, but having real um, specific information and the real benefit of doing study abroad would be important. And if that includes Japan, even better. Yeah. Yeah, I've totally seen for myself, like personally, the real value of studying abroad, um, not only those practical skills, but also like, I learned a lot about myself, I think, through the process of going abroad and getting outside of my, my hometown. So um, yeah, after having done that, I definitely wish other people can have that same opportunity that I was lucky mm -hmm. to have. Um, kind of continuing along on the thread of IUC related questions. Um, you had said that IUC was like always on your radar. There were like a few events that kind of turned turned you towards making the decision to go to IUC. But um, did you consider other language schools, and what ultimately made you choose the the IUC over possibly other programs? Right. So for um, the period of so I I guess because I had already finished my uh, graduate studies. I wanted to focus on um, just the like the language uh, acquisition um, and 
kind of, how do I want to say it? I needed the most bang for my buck, right? I needed a really focused program that would have a good um, return on my investment um, for, and whereas I maybe could have taken a little bit more time and gone to some other programs, my experience with IUC was uh, from other friends who had done the program and explained to me that, yeah, this is something that would be helpful. And a lot of these were JET friends. Um, so when, I would ask the community um, the information of what would be received from having the, the 10 months at IUC was always quite positive. And after, you know, looking at it a little bit more was um, accessible. Uh, so yeah, IUC was always kind of like my gold standard for if I, if I could, oh, maybe I'll do that someday in the future. And then I decide, okay, well, I need to just go ahead and do it. Yeah. Uh, related to the comment, more bang for your buck, we actually have a question about financial aid at IUC. Um, so sort of like if there is aid available and if students are able to get scholarships. Um, I know that I definitely benefited from receiving many scholarships to go oh, yeah. to the IUC. Um, so maybe you can also talk a little bit about your experience. Yes, and that actually, you know, unfortunately, the financial barrier uh, my perceived financial barrier of studying at IUC prevented me from applying to IUC for many years. And it's unfortunate because I didn't, I, you know, because I wasn't in a PhD program, I wasn't doing grad studies, I'm like, I'm not going to have funding. How am I going to, you know, afford this? I, it can't possibly work. And what happened was I actually had a talk with another IUC person. And I was like, you know, I'm thinking of IUC, but I can't afford it. And then they were like, you need to apply because <laughs> there is funding available that's not the Blakemore. You know, the Blakemore scholarship was always the only thing on my radar. Like, if I don't get the Blakemore, I can't go to the IUC, right? And they were like, no, just apply because that is part part of the um, you know process of applying to IUC is that um, if you if there is funding and you do qualify for it, then you could get it. Right, and so I applied to see if I could get accepted. I was accepted. I was still working at the time, so this was always like, well, if it doesn't work this year, maybe I can work and save some more money for later. Um, and then the second uh, notification came that, okay, well, we have um, the scholarship um, package um, that we can present to you. And it, I, I had several scholarships, um, and combined, I was able to um, cover my cost of tuition at IUC, um, and then I also had. A, a lot of savings <laughs> and so I was able to um, top off the other needs and a lot of support from the family as well to, to um, help me <laughs> make it through those 10 months of living like a student again as opposed to being a, um, a, a full-time worker and so um, it's possible and I think that the thing that my IUC might benefit from is not to just say well there's money here for you to study at IUC but at least to let people know that it's not impossible to study at IUC just because you know you can't, you know, you don't have the money offhand to, to pay for it. Um, and that person that told me about that was a, a, somebody who had finished the program herself. Butler -san, thank you so much for the wonderful discussion. Thank I you always learn uh, more about your yeah. background every time. No, I, and I think one of the great things, just to wrap up, one of the great things about IUC is, as well is that. We have such a variety of people and backgrounds and research interests. And I loved learning about Leclerc Sun's amazing experiences and her um, presentation was great and my other classmates as well. It's just, it's just a great community to be a part of. Agreed, thank you.